My name is Charlie Hale. I'm director of the Teresa Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies, which is the sponsoring institution for this dialogue this afternoon. The format is going to be the following. Our, our speaker will present a, a, an overview of, of uh, the, the topic that concerns us, the, the city of Juarez, and questions of violence, of uh, the endemic problems that now uh, confronting the border in other parts of Mexico and the United States around these issues. And then we'll have uh, three uh, brief presentations in the form of questions and dialogue with, uh, with the, uh, the mayor from our three distinguished panelists. And uh, that will take about the first hour of our, uh, of our afternoon. The second hour, we'd like to have a uh, tightly moderated discussion <coughs> dialogue between you all and, and our speaker, which I'll, which I'll uh, uh, be moderating, and I'll, I'll ask you right now ahead of time to think of questions, think of uh, uh, any topic that concerns you, but make sure that uh, you're, you're brief and focused in order to give a chance for as many people as possible to speak, and, and also uh, for this to really be a, a, a back and forth, a dialogue around issues that are of great concern uh, to all of us. I'm going to start by introducing uh, our three, the three uh, panelists, and then finally with uh, introducing our distinguished speaker. <clears throat> to my left here is Professor Ricardo Ansley. He's professor of educational psychology at the University of Texas. Here, his research is on uh, focused on study of psychoanalysis and cultural experience, and examines a series of topics, including those uh, directly relevant to. Uh, the panel this afternoon. He's made a film called Crossover, a story of desegregation. <clears throat> He's uh, a native of Mexico City, Mexico. Uh, uh, next we have our next, our next panelist will be our, our uh, very own beloved uh, NPR reporter, John Burnett. Uh, he's, whenever we hear, when I, whenever I hear John on, on NPR, I feel great source of pride, that's, that's a reporter that comes right here, that lives right here in Austin, Texas. He's uh, <clears throat> well known to many of you, I'm sure. He's, he's reported on a wide range of uh, very important topics, including uh, the, uh, the aftermath of, of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, uh, the U.S. invasion of Iraq, and the drug war in the Americas. He reports on a whole, a whole series of, of NPR uh, news magazines, including Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and The Weekend Edition. He also uh, had a long stint before coming to NPR with uh, United Press International covering uh, from Guatemala, covering the, central, the civil wars in Central America. And our third panelist is uh, Professor Cecilia Bailly, who is from my own home department of anthropology. She received her PhD from Rice University. <clears throat> her main interests are the U.S.-Mexican border. She has uh, research on gender violence in, in Juarez and other areas along the border, uh, Latino expressive culture, and narrative writing. She's also, very importantly, in addition to being an anthropologist, a journalist, and has, has written uh, uh, much, much uh, journalistic work, particularly for the Texas Monthly. She's also currently working on a project having to do with the uh, the wall on the, the Texas, U.S. Uh, Mexican border. So I, I want to uh, uh, welcome our three panelists and thank them for uh, being present here in this very important event. Now it's a, a special pleasure uh, to introduce and to welcome here to the University of Texas the Honorable Mayor of the City of Juarez, Jose Reyes Feliz. He's currently serving term as mayor from 2007 to 2010. <clears throat> He's uh, trained as a lawyer both in, and has, and has uh, licensing both in Mexico and California. He received a law degree from the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad de Juárez and a master's degree in international law from the University of Notre Dame in 1988. His, his law practice involves areas of commerce, banking, international law, and uh, immigration, cross-border issues, etc. And also, in addition to his work as mayor of the city of Juarez since 2007, he also is a professor at the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juarez uh, in, in the city of Juarez. And he's spoken on issues concerning the city 
uh, in, many, in many venues, both in Mexico and the United States, and we're very uh, pleased and honored to have him at the University of Texas this afternoon. Uh, please join me then in welcoming the Honorable Mayor of the City of Juarez, Jose Reyes Feliz. Good afternoon to all. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be at the University of Texas. I've never been to the campus. I have many friends, many attorneys who talk so much about the university, and uh, it, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks to uh, Ricardo Inslee for the uh, uh, invitation, Cecilia Valle, muchas gracias, John Burnett, who I uh, have been in, in Juarez and has been in my office for interviews. Thank you. And of course, uh, Charlie Hale for uh, organizing this event. Thank you. I think in order to understand what is happening in Juarez, you need to go back a few years and you need to uh, see what has happened in the past in, in the city of Juarez. And uh, you can go back too much, but uh, basically I want to go back uh, to the late 50s and, uh, and, and do a timeline of, of what is happening. First, uh, a major thing that happened and, and that makes Juarez very different from, many, from any other city or many other cities in Mexico and in the world is the creation of the maquiladora industry. Juarez in the 50s was basically a city that was involved in commerce. A uh, very small city, it wasn't the largest city in the state by any means, uh, a small commercial city. But then in 1968, RCA opened its first company in, in Ciudad Juarez and started the production of televisions in, in Juarez. At that time, uh, the production of televisions, uh, few the professors would remember the old televisions uh, that had bulbs and things. Uh, you young kids have not seen those televisions, but uh, televisions had very small parts, and those small parts had to be put into boards, welded, uh, and so the maquila industry hired mainly women. Uh, I would say 90% women, because it was thought that women would do delicate type of work, and, and that has a lot to do with what happened later on uh, in what is in the killings of women's uh, in the late 90s or the, the 90s, that is also something that uh, has affected our city tremendously. So uh, that was created in 1960s. Uh, but then uh, what happened with the uh, maquila industry is that it started to grow and we reached full employment. Juarez is one of the cities in the world that can say that we have had full employment for most of the last 25 years. Uh, not many cities in the world can say that. Juarez is also a city that can uh, say that uh, industry is, creates most of our jobs. Most cities in the world, uh, jobs are created in the service sector. And Juarez, most of the jobs are created in the industrial sector. And that is also an important factor for our our companies. At that point, when we reached full employment, we started hiring both men and women. And uh, uh, but another phenomenon happened is that we started importing workers. We ran out of workers in uh, in Juarez, and we started importing workers first from neighboring cities in the state, uh, then from na neighboring states, uh, Durango, Zacatecas, uh, Aguascalientes. And uh, at that same time, there was a gentleman, his name was Rafael Aguilar. He was the chief of the federal investigators in Juarez. He was a policeman. He was also the head of Interpol in Juarez. And Rafael Aguilar created the Juarez cartel. Uh, we could probably go back a little bit more and 
and talk about the Juarez Cartel and other figures in the Juarez Cartel, but the real strong Juarez Cartel was created by Rafael Aguilar, a police officer. The federal, the federal, <coughs> federal police, uh, investigative police in, in, in Juarez. And that is a very important factor because of the influence that the police has had in the, that particular organized crime group. The organization that uh, Rafael Aguilar had was an organization that had links to Sinaloa. Sinaloa is the, the place where most of the agricultural production in Mexico takes place. Uh, it, it's the heartland of, of Mexico. It's, a, it's the best uh, community for growing uh, tomatoes. We uh, Right now we have a big campaign in Mexico about Mexican tomatoes and uh, uh, those are grown in, in Sinaloa. Marijuana was started to grow in Sinaloa. And the Juarez Cartel <coughs> initial business was the export of marijuana into the United States. That was its main core business. Uh, and, and that was its business because cocaine was produced in Colombia and it was shipped to Florida. In the 80s, about 80% of the cocaine that was consumed in the United States came to Florida or California. Most of it came to Florida. Florida had tremendous problems, killings, federal government, police corruption, federal government had to intervene uh, and stop the uh, corruption and everything that was taking place in Florida in the 80s. And there was even a TV show at that time called Miami Vice about uh, the fight against uh, cocaine coming in from Colombia. The United States did a tremendous job in stopping that flow of drugs uh, through Colombia. With, uh, at the same time, we had the, the immigration coming into Juarez. Uh, by the 80s, that migration came uh, from the, the neighboring states, states, as I said. Uh, but then it, 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 uh, it went all over the place. We started importing about 3,000 families a month to Juarez. We have so much work in Juarez with full employment and the growth of the maquila industry at the highest rate that of growth that we had had in Mexico that we sent buses to the poorest communities in Mexico, in Veracruz, in Oaxaca, in Chiapas, and just brought in able bodies to work in Juarez, gave them a home. Most people in Juarez, different than any place in Mexico, they get a new home within two months after they start working. Uh, that we, we created in the last five years, 20,000 new homes per year for those <coughs> workers. New homes, not small, but uh, very different from the homes that these poor people were uh, used to in, in their communities in Chiapas and Oaxaca and other places. And then they start bringing their families. And of course, we give them jobs. Now, that whole thing uh, created the mistake of Juarez. We thought when we reached full employment that the fact that workers in Juarez were making three times as much as they were working any other place in the country, and that a father, a mother, and any older son or daughter could work in Juarez after they reached <coughs> age 16 would solve the social problems. We thought, you know, why go ahead and create infrastructure, social infrastructure, if they have the money to do it themselves? And we started creating economic infrastructure, which was, I think, tremendous mistake the, the Juarez government did and the Mexican government did. We started creating roads, we started creating uh, industrial parks, we started creating uh, more border crossings and everything else that we needed to grow and continue the economic growth of the city while neglecting social issues. 
those kids in the 80s, when we reached full employment, started growing in the streets. Because Mexico is a, is a society that has a very tight family structure. Mom and dad, grandpa and grandma, everybody's there all the time. And our system of taking care of children is a system created nationwide, and it's, and it's working right now in Mexico, everywhere in Mexico. It cover kid, covers kids from age four months to age four years. After four years, a kid in Mexico is supposed to go to school, grammar school. He's there for three hours or four hours a day. And then he goes out, and he's taken care of the mother works, the father and mother works, by grandma and the aunts and, and the sisters. Well, that didn't work in Juarez because most of the population in Juarez had been imported. 70% of adults in Juarez today were not born in Juarez. I'm the mayor, I wasn't born in Juarez. My father was the mayor, he wasn't born in Juarez. So, the fact that we didn't have the family structure made the social structure inadequate to take care of the kids. Those kids, after reaching age four, went to uh, work, their mothers went to work, they went to, to grammar school, after grammar school they were on the streets, learning from gangs, learning from the people just outside, and basically we lost at least one, maybe two generations of young kids. Those kids in the 80s are now the kids doing crime in the street. At that same time, this man named Mergreñas was put in jail. He was very linked to the uh, cartel, which was now exporting tremendous amounts of marijuana into the United States. And uh, he was part of an organization that had now uh, killed Rafael Aguilar and was now being managed by Rafael Muñoz. Uh, Rafael Muñoz was to be, used to be the son of a butcher in Juarez. He had a great restaurant, a small restaurant. They sold the best tripitas uh, in Juarez. <coughs> and when I was a kid, I used to go there, and, and he was the waiter. He was now the head of the largest criminal organization in Mexico. Greñas was put in jail, and, and his being in jail is significant on what is happening now. Uh, the organization was created with state policemen. They had corrupted the state police, and the state policemen were handling the Juarez cartel at that time. Now, uh, what happened later was very important. Operation Hold the Line was created. Operation Hold the Line was created by a very bright gentleman. His name is Silvestre Reyes. He's a congressman from El Paso. He's now the chairman of the uh, Congressional Committee on uh, Intelligence Intelligence Committee, he uh, was the head of the Border Patrol at that time. And when Operation Hold the Line began, what Operation Hold the Line did was stop the flow of drugs into the United States. And the amount of drugs that were there in Juarez started to create a local consumption of drugs. The local consumption of drugs in Juarez is the largest consumption of drugs we have in Mexico. Uh, only Tijuana compares, but they, uh, they have a smaller rate than, than Juarez, and it was created in, at one point because of Hold the Line, but 
uh, at another point uh, because of uh, the events of September 11, 2001. The, this is the most significant issue. When the federal government in the United States closes down what used to be known as the Caribbean route for cocaine, which came from Colombia to the Caribbean and into Florida mainly. When the US managed to close it down, the Colombian cartel started to try and find other ways into the United States. They didn't know how to do it, so this man proposed to the Colombian cartels that they use the structure they have to bring in marijuana into the United States to bring in cocaine into the United States. And a joint venture was formed between those two groups. Joint venture that was where the largest group were the Colombian cartels, the Mexican cartels were just the distributors or the, uh, the ones taking drugs into the United States. But these groups were very successful. At that point, only 20% of cocaine consumed in the United States was brought in through Mexico. Most of it came in through Florida and California. The, the growth of the uh, transportation of cocaine through Mexico was exponential. By uh, that well, late 1990s, the, the previous one talked about uh, how there was local consumption. Local consumption started growing tremendously. <coughs> what is killing of women began in the, in the 90s, uh, mainly linked to the use of drugs. Uh, that's a very large subject uh, to touch at this point, but uh, just to make a reference. And uh, Juarez uh, started to grow its areas because of the large movement of people, 100,000 people moving into Juarez every year, uh, 30,000 families moving into Juarez every year. We needed to grow, and, and we didn't have the way to grow the city. Uh, unfortunately, the decision was made on the west side, which is, which is the hillside of this <coughs> desert, that is why it is. Uh, it was decided that uh, owners would be allowed to sell land without the land being developed. And this is the type of homes that you see on the west side of what is no pavement, at that point, they had no water, no sewage, uh, and of course, very little security because there's no, it is very hard terrain to, to patrol. That's where the population started, started growing in that. Uh, about 40% of the population lived in Juarez, or lives in Juarez on the west side, that, that area that has those, uh, those types of homes. The killings uh, between the cartels started. At that point, one significant uh, thing is that all the killings were made in private. Uh, we had hundreds <coughs> of people that disappeared. Uh, and those people that disappeared, somebody would come in, they would pick them up. We call them levantones. <coughs> they would be picked up taken someplace, killed, and then buried in clandestine uh, killing fields or fields. We found later uh, about a dozen places where such killings or such people were buried uh, and found hundreds of bodies like that. There's a lot more that haven't been found that, that have been buried like that. Uh, and, and one significant thing for, about this is that the reason this happened was at that point uh, the United States had a ban on the sale of uh, 
assault weapons. The assault weapons ban was in effect, and so there weren't any assault weapons in Mexico. All the killings were made with handguns, and uh, those that changed later on. Uh, by that point, what Amado Carrillo did was he separated from the structure that used to control the uh, <coughs> the Juarez cartel. The structure that used to control the Juarez cartel used to be the state police. The new organization was created with the city police. And the old state police officers that used to work in the uh, and the cartel just went someplace else, mainly to the state of Sonora. Some of them went to the state of Sinaloa. The Juarez cartel became strong then with the presence and with the help of the city police. The city police uh, chiefs started to get killed because of cleanups within the organization. Uh, and uh, at, at one point, the organization split. Assault weapon bans expired, uh, and assault weapons began to be sold. When assault weapons began to be sold, then the killings in Juarez and everywhere else in Mexico, for that matter, began to become very public events. <coughs> if the killings were uh, on the streets, if they would just because the other guy may have uh, an assault weapon also, so they just. Uh, showed up, surprised them, and killed them right there with uh, an AK-47 and a couple hundred uh, shots. Uh, September 11th closed down the borders further. And the United States decided to start de deporting criminals. Up to that point, the United States policy was, or the law, I think, was that immigration could not communicate with other agencies about the fact that somebody was illegal. So somebody may be illegal in the country and may have been in jail, but the county officer could not tell the immigration department that they had an illegal alien in the jail. <coughs> the United States changed the policy and made it a policy that everybody needed to be, who went to jail needed to be checked for uh, immigration violations, and so everybody who was an illegal alien uh, that was in jail had to be deported, and uh, and that became the case about ten years ago. When they started, uh, the United States decided they needed to deport persons into the area that made it the most difficult to come in to come back into the United States. If you deport somebody into Tijuana, when you cross the Tijuana border into San Diego, you're in New York the next day. Getting to San Diego means there's no way anybody can have a point where they're going to search you and see that you're legally in the country. Uh, if you get to San Diego, you're in LA then within the next two or three hours. There's so many roads going from San Diego to LA that it's hard for the Border Patrol to, to stop anybody. And then you're in an airport and then you're flying all over the country and, and it's very easy to get back to the United States. Same thing happens in Sonora. When you cross into Arizona border, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a desert, but then there's Tucson. And that makes it very easy to get into the United States. That doesn't happen in El Paso. The closest city to El Paso is Albuquerque, a small city in New Mexico, about 600,000. Uh, it's about a four hour drive, and it's a desert. And there's mountains, and there's, uh, it's so difficult to get into the United States that when somebody crosses illegally into El Paso, the Border Patrol has complete control. They're, they're not getting out of El Paso that easy. So the United States policy was to deport into violence, especially criminals. About 100,000 people were deported into Juarez every year. 7,000 of them 
for criminals, hardcore criminals. We had one of the last cases, very painful case of a killing of a woman. <coughs> uh, young girl named Aires Estrella was killed. The community was outraged. Uh, they found the killer. The killer had was a child abuser from Colorado that had been deported a few months before uh, into Juarez, and he uh, he was the one who, who killed her. Well, that was the type of person that was being deported into Juarez. But mainly those deported into Juarez were criminals within the criminal gangs in the United States. In the late 80s, criminal, Mexican criminal gangs started to form in the US jails because there was a lot of racial violence against Mexican criminals or Mexican jail inmates. And something called the Mexican Mafia started. That Mexican Mafia derived into the Aztecas, Barrio Azteca, the Mexicles, the Artistas Asesinos, the Killer Assassins, and other gangs were formed, like the Mara Salvatrucha that operate in Guatemala and Salvador, and, and other gangs like that. So, those gangs uh, began working in, uh, and were being deported into Juarez. We now have about 7,000 Aztecas in Juarez. We, just in jail, we have 1,200 of them. We have about 2,000 Mexicles and Artistas Asesinos, sworn enemies of the Aztecas, uh, also living within our community. We have about 400 of them in jail. That's a very significant factor. Uh, the uh, 2007, Gilberto Tivera Segreñas was released from jail. When Gilberto Tiveros was released from jail, he went back to his old buddies in Sinaloa. By this point, his buddies have created their own cartel called the Sinaloa Cartel or the Pacific Cartel. And Gilberto Tiveros had the idea of bringing in, bringing back the old state police officers that used to help uh, the Juarez Cartel but were thrown out. And a war began. I was in my office a couple days after Christmas 2007. Somebody said, you know, I need to talk to the mayor. He came in. He told me I was in a bar last night. I heard that a war is going to begin in Juarez January 6th. And they said it's going to be a bloody war. Told the federal police January 5th. January 6th is significant because it's the last day of the Christmas vacation in Mexico. January 5th, the war started. They began by killing all of the heads of the Mexican, of the Juarez Police Department. Uh, they, those that were not killed in the first two weeks of the war, uh, signs were left in the city saying, we're gonna kill these guys. And it, it was all <coughs> of the uh, heads of the police department. The, uh, that war was a war that lasted throughout 2008. 1,600 people died in Juarez in 2008. At that point, only 30 were classified as innocent civilians. But the war was, was bloody. One day, two suburban trucks were fighting at each other with 50 caliber military grade <coughs> assault weapons. The kind of assault weapons you use to shoot down airplanes. They shoot 400 rounds a minute. And they were fighting in the quiet streets among each other. By 2009, the, uh, well, <coughs> 2008, the city of Juarez, which has uh, a very, which had been uh, full employment for so many years, is linked 55% 
to the automobile industry. Your car, if your car is newer than a 97, the seats were made in Juarez. The electrical equipment was made in Juarez. Uh, very likely the headlights and the taillights were made in Juarez. 55% of our industry is linked to the automobile industry. The U.S. automobile industry goes broke in 2008. We lose 75,000 jobs in about eight months. That means we lost 25% of our industrial jobs. We're running about 20% unemployment in June of last year. The rest of our industry is linked to the uh, durable goods industry. <coughs> if you bought a refrigerator within the last six years, washer, dryer, it was probably made in Juarez. Most of the refrigerators sold in Canada and the United States are made in Juarez uh, right now. Durable goods were down. Only our most, smallest industry, which is the medical industry, kept growing, but that only represents 15% of our economy. So that's the situation we're living on <coughs> in Juarez. Now, uh, 2009, 2008, we do a cleanup in the police department. We fire half of the police force in Juarez. We start recruiting. The Mexican Army comes in. I go to the Mexican Army and tell them, we need your help <coughs> to patrol the city. Crime is just getting out of control. We're not going to be able to control it if we wait until we reinforce our police department. The Mexican Army came in. They said, we're going into Juarez under a few conditions. One, we suggest who the heads of the police department will be. About 35 active duty and retired military officers were sent to Juarez, including General Julian David Rivera Breton, three-star general, to head the Juarez Police Department. 2,400 police officers were also sent, uh, army officers were also sent to act within the police department. And they said, the third condition is this is only temporary. The initial agreement was for six months. I negotiated and pleaded with them to keep them longer and managed to keep them for a year. By the end of the year, which was just three weeks ago, we had managed to clean up the police department as best we could. It's not 100% clean, and I'm not going to suggest otherwise. We managed to reinforce our police department. It went from 1,600 to 3,000 police officers. And with that, the Army withdrew from the city of Juarez on Thursday of last week. I should state it again. The Army withdrew from the police department in Juarez on Thursday of last week. They had already withdrawn half the police force in September of, of the Army officers they had sent. They had sent 2,400 troops. They retired 1,200 of them uh, initially. Now, while we did our build-up, the Mexican government there did, did theirs. President Felipe Calderón got uh, about uh, 4,000 federal officers when he took office. There are now 40,000 federal officers in Mexico. He now has the strength to send in police officers. When I first asked the federal uh, police for help, they sent in 200 federal police officers. Now, last week, they sent 5,000 federal police officers to help us in Juarez. I think the, and what has happened since the intervention of the Army in uh, last year, March of last year, was that with 11,000 people patrolling Juarez, that was no longer a good route 
to bring cocaine into the U.S. Cocaine started flowing through other places, mainly the Caribbean route, which had been uh, forgotten for over 20 years. Puerto Rico grew to a thousand killings last year. It's an island, the whole island is 2.3 million. Bahamas went to 1,800 killings last year. It's also about 2.3 million. Costa Rica, Salvador, and Honduras, and Guatemala have grown tremendously in the killings that they have because the cocaine routes now go through Central America and through the Caribbean. Only 60% of cocaine consumed in the United States comes from Mexico. It used to be 90% by 2006 when President Felipe Calderón took office. That's the situation today. That's uh, what we have. And for the most part, the killings between the drug cartels, the Sinaloa cartel and the Juarez cartel, have ceased in Juarez. They have ceased since March of last year. Because there's so many people patrolling, they don't want to take their cocaine through Juarez. They, they can take it someplace else. It comes from Colombia. There's so many ways to bring it into the United States. They can do it through any other place. But because the flow of cocaine stopped coming through Juarez, Criminal gangs related to those criminal organizations are now without income. And they want to find a way to have income. And what they're doing in June of last year, they begin a war between the Aztecas, the Artistas Asesinos, and the Mexicles. They begin a war for the very lucrative <coughs> retail sale market in Juarez. And those killings that we had last year in Juarez, over 2,600 of them, are mainly linked to those criminal elements, criminal gangs, not necessarily to the criminal uh, organizations that used to be fighting in 2008. That makes the fighting that we have to do with them different than the one we had initially designed <coughs> for what was happening in 2008. And, uh, well, it's, uh, it's still happening. Just uh, yesterday we had one killing. Uh, the day before we had six killings. The two days before that we had no killings. The average in the month of March was six killings a day. The average in the month of February was five killings a day. The average in the month of August, before we had our build up in the police department, was 12 killings a day. <coughs> so uh, things are not back to normal. And we haven't solved the problem. It, it's, uh, it's still a lot of work that needs to be done. But uh, the federal government, the state government, and the city government have been working on that. And I think with that, I'll. Uh, uh, set the background for your questions, which I think will be very interesting. And I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Or extorted. 
And in particular, I'm thinking about the uh, the uh, visit by uh, <coughs> President Calderon's team uh, in March, uh, in, in, I guess February. And, and what I heard uh, repeatedly among uh, business people, for example, which surprised me because I've been hearing this on the streets of Guadalajara, was the, uh, the refrain was, we can pay taxes, we can pay our employees, or we can play, pay the quota, which the uh, gangs and the cartels are extracting from people, but we can't pay all three. <clears throat> and around the same time, there was a, a, a front page story, and I think it was the Diario El Norte, that said even the candy vendors, the juice vendors, are being extorted for quota. <clears throat> My question, the first question is, how does a city, function when there's that level of vulnerability and what can be done or what are you doing to try to address that level of vulnerability in the citizen? Crime Stoppers is a 
well-known institution in the United States. It's been working in El Paso, Texas uh, for the last 32 years. Uh, Univision, the Spanish network in, in El, El Paso, ends a lot of their uh, criminal information saying, you know, if you have information on this or any other criminal activity, call Crime Stoppers. So Juarenses have known about Crime Stoppers for the last 30 years. They trust it. And we made an agreement. It's the first city in Latin America to have an agreement like that. Uh, and uh, we received by now about 500 credible uh, tips that we're following. One of the tips we got, it wasn't related to extortion, but we got a tip that said, there's an old uh, <coughs> place where they bury the cemetery. Uh, cemetery. There, there's an old cemetery. Nobody has been buried there for the last 40 years. There's some people there uh, that congregate uh, a lot. And, you know, they're not <coughs> going to visit somebody we put a camera there, uh, and yes, there, there were young people there. They, they were just talking for about three hours, and they started moving. They went to a crib, opened the crib, and started pulling AK-47s from the crib. Uh, we were able to put them in jail, and it was a tip we got from Crime Stoppers. So uh, we, we haven't been able, and, and we're working. When President Calderon came into to Juarez, and that was a, a very important uh, issue, when he came to Juarez, he formed the, uh, the crime prevention social table. And there we have social leaders, and they're working to see how we can get first-hand information on extortion and, and kidnapping cases so that we can uh, put those criminals in jail. We, we haven't been able to stop it. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's right now, I think, one of the, the crimes that's affecting us the most. Well, we have one way of, we could have, each of the panels will have two questions, and then we'll, we'll go down the row, and then we'll, and then we'll open up the, uh, for one more, one more question. My other question had to do with uh, uh, the change in policy of the federal government in relation to what? And, uh, <clears throat> In, in February, uh, a new development emerges in which, for the first time, as I understand it, uh, funding is going to come in for social problems. So it seems to me there was a change in conceptualization from a purely military strategy to one that involved social programs. And I'm wondering if you could speak to, number one, how that decision was made, what kind of conversations took place that made people awakened to the idea that a military solution was inadequate. And secondly, how are those funds going to be used? And how, what's going to be the mechanism for assessing the utility of that effort? I, I, I think that's very important. That, I, I, I wouldn't say the military solution was inadequate. I, I don't think that's a fact. The, the solution is a police solution. We need to solve this with force. We need to solve this with a police department. That's uh, there's no question about that. But as we saw before, the Mexican government just stopped investing in social issues, and that was a big mistake. And we need to revert that mistake. Juarez is the city, not only the city with the largest consumption of drugs in the country, but it's also the city with the largest amount of kids that drop out of junior high school. It's also the city with the smallest number of uh, high schools per capita in the country, even though it's one of the richest cities in the country. Uh, it's uh, the west side, where you saw the, all of that growth in the 80s. 400,000 people live there. There's just one public high school for 400,000 population. The Colegio de la Frontera did a study on uh, juvenile violence and compared it to opportunities. And in comparing it to opportunities, and compared it to the number of high schools. And it was just like, and they put a map together and 
it was just like looking at oil and water. Where there's a high school, there's no uh, incidence of, or small <laughs> incidence of uh, juvenile violence. Where there's no high schools, there's a very high incidence of juvenile violence. So we knew the solution is a police solution, but in order to make it a person a permanent solution, we need to go into uh, the federal government, or we need to go, to go into the real problem, and the real problem is a social problem. So what we decided to do last year was go to the Inter-American Bank of uh, Development Bank. They were the experts that developed in <coughs> Colombia, which brought down the violence in Colombia tremendously. And we told them, we need your help. They sent in their experts. By June, we had developed plan to give uh, social infrastructure to, to solve the social issues that are the root of the problem. <coughs> we went to the federal government, took that program to them, presented it. They liked it, but we worked for about six months to get it started. The president announced that it was going to do it uh, in November of last year. Final details were hammered out and uh, the president finally uh, started the program in February of last year, just after 12 high school <coughs> kids were killed in a party. Uh, kids were double-A football players. One of the gangs in this fight is called the Artistas Asesinos, or double-A's. <coughs> Somebody said, you know, there's a party with the double A's over there. The Aztecas rival group went in and killed all of them, shoot 12 other young kids, girls. Uh, they, they weren't gang double A's, they were double A football players. The, uh, uh, right after that, the president announced that it's a $300 million program. First thing they're going to do is build five high schools the West Side, uh, 100 daycare centers for kids 4 to 12. The city government had done 50 already. They're going to build 100 more. They're going to open every school in the city so that kids can stay over in the schools until 6 o'clock at no cost. Because we have a huge economic problem, we still have about 50,000 people out of work. <coughs> 5,000 temporary jobs will be created. 18,000 grants will be given to persons who want to train with the maquila industry with a pay. That brings us to 23,000 temporary people temporarily working. And about $5 million will be given out in grants to people wanting to start a business, a small business. That will probably create about another 5,000 jobs. So we'll be at about 37,000 temporary jobs while the economy picks up and, uh, and when we get things back in order. That's uh, the main issues of the, uh, of the program. But the program uh, is very important. About a month ago, we stopped uh, sicarios in Canada. And when they asked them how, how much they were making, they were making $40 a week to kill. Young kids making $40 a week for killing. That means they're not getting rich. They're not there to make it, uh, to make a lot of money. They're there because they're hungry. They need to put food on the table and $40 a week killing is the best they can do. We need to change that. And, and, and I think the social program that the president announced is, is actually what's going to change that. Um, Senor Alcalde, thank you for coming to Austin. Um, I cannot imagine how difficult it is to, um, uh, to, to go around and, and represent a city which is being called uh, one of the murder capitals of the world now. And thank you for sharing your reality with us. I wanted to explore your characterization 
of the intervention of the Army in Juarez's success. Um, I've been in Juarez a fair amount the last uh, uh, month, and I've done interviews um, in this country and in Mexico City as well. Um, this was a grand experiment uh, early in President Calderon's sexenio to dispatch, to deploy army troops to a major urban center in Mexico. It really hadn't been done before and to give them law enforcement powers to clean up the police department. So it's been an experiment. And after two years, we have the results of that experiment. There are certainly some audiences who would like the troops to stay. And I've talked to them, and they feel like they have um, brought some order to the streets. But the sentiment that I hear overwhelmingly is that the Army have committed wholesale human rights abuses I cannot tell you how many stories I heard. They came into houses looking for guns, looking for drugs, and then they proceeded to rob the occupants. Uh, Gustavo de la Rosa, who is the State Human Rights Commissioner for Chihuahua, who is now living in exile in El Paso, has 270 complaints against, um, against the Army, which the Army says that they are um, investigating, but since their proceedings uh, are secret, we're not aware of the results of those. And then there are also reports that, in fact, since the army came to town, that they have allied themselves with one drug, drug cartel and now have the, um, are basically offering a, a protection racket to that cartel. So I would ask you, um, there are, the, my sources have characterized the intervention of the army in Juarez as a failure. And that is one reason why they were pulled out last Thursday and that why the federal government is now um, putting so much of his resources into the federal police to try something different. Um, and I was wondering if you would, you would um, uh, explore for me um, why, why is it that the expectations of the Army's involvement in, in the Juarez drug war have fallen so short? I think that's uh, about half of the people in the, that has had that same question to just taken that from them. The, when this whole thing started, one of the first things the federal police and the army did was get a court order to listen in on suspected activity by police officers on their phones. <coughs> A couple days into it, police officer gets a call. The call says, I want such so and so kid, about 18 years old. He's in his home right now. His home is at that, this particular address. And I want you to take him and give him to me at this, uh, this mall. City police car. Well, this is this guy receiving the call is one of the mid-level managers of, or mid-level chiefs of the police. He uses that same phone and calls two police officers in a patrol car. Tells them what to do. City police car. Two police officers, uniform, go to the home of this young man take him out of his home, put him in the car, take him to the mall. At the mall, there are officers looking at the transaction. He's put into the organized crime figure's car. Federal officers follow the car, cannot reach him. Two hours later, the kid is dead. Police car. Police officers were detained. Uh, both the two officers in the car and the mid-level chief. When they were interrogated, they said, yeah, we've been doing this for a while. In fact, we've killed 12 persons already. They've been buried in the edge of town. They go to the edge of town, dig up. They, they found nine bodies. They also found 
the badge of one of the police officers. That was what we were dealing with when this whole thing started. The police department were the criminals. The police department were the agents of organized crime acting in the city. The Army had to come in, and we had to fire so many officers, and we had to recruit so many new officers, and we had to train those officers. Every one of the officers in Juarez has been trained where the Special Forces train in Mexico. This is the only police department in Mexico that's been allowed to do that. All of the police officers in Juarez are trained and are authorized to use automatic weapons. It's the only police department in the country that can do that. Not even state police department officials can handle automatic weapons. It has been a tremendous change. And that change could not have been done without the presence and the participation of the Army. We needed the Army to do, first of all, contention work, contain the problem while we solved our police problem. And then we needed them to recruit, train, and prepare a police department that we could trust. We've been able to do that. As far as that goes, that's a great success. Population, of course, and, and it goes uh, a little bit until, uh, to Ricardo's question, population is upset. Population said, from the onset, do something. You have to solve this. Well, to solve it, you have to do, go to the root of the problem. The, the root of the problem is really hard to, to change. We had to change it. So the population wanted an immediate change. And when the Army came in, we saw it temporarily, but it didn't last because criminals changed. And when the criminals changed, uh, the crime went up again. And the population said, the Army didn't do their work. I say, no. The Army was not the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem is a police solution. We need a good police department. The federal government didn't have a large enough police department. The city didn't have a large enough police department. We now do. We're now all the police department. All the actions in the city are police actions, not military actions. And in order to have the time to prepare to do that, we needed the Army there to help, and they did. But they weren't the solution. And, and of course, the population uh, wants a solution. They, they, they don't care how. And they expected the largest institution in Mexico to do it. The Army has 360,000 troops. So they expected they could do it. But they're an army. They're not a police force. And, and then that's why there's, I think, the, the main difference uh, in perspective. I, I think the army did was this, uh, an, an important step at that point. They did do it. Uh, now we, we need to continue on with the police. But I, 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 let me just follow up with the same point. I mean, I, I think your own citizens would, would ask you, how can you characterize their presence in what is a success when the murders continued apace. And, um, and the testimony that we got again and again is that the military showed up after the Cicadios did their work, that there was no intervention to actually prevent anyone from killing anyone. Um, and then in terms of a show driving around the city, you know, yes, they, they did fly the flag, but in some cases you replaced corrupt police with corrupt officers. Well, I think that's a, that's a very important uh, issue. And, and uh, the, main, the main thing, what, what happened initially, the killings in 2008 were killings uh, done by organized crime. And, and the killings were, they had, and, and I don't know the exact number, but they, they may have maybe had 30 safe houses in the city. And so organized crime traveled from one of their safe houses with AK-47s 
They traveled four or five miles within the city in suburbans. Four or five suburbans. Police officers corrupt. The ones that were corrupt, there were two officers in a police car with nine millimeter weapons. They're not going to stop three suburbans with guys with AK 47s. They traveled from one place to the other, did the killing, they traveled back to another safe house. That was the initial thing. When the Army came in, we designed the structure of the work so that we would have a large patrol presence in the city. We had, at that point, about 80 police cars patrolling the whole city. That was it. We went to about 400 police cars patrolling the city. With that, they couldn't do those movements. We started to see killings, but those killings were no longer with assault weapons. The killings were small caliber guns. And then we saw that what, we, what was happening when we captured the initial killers that we captured, we saw that what they had done was they had they, their former police officers, so they know our structure, they know our patrolling areas, our patrolling sectors. So they created a structure similar to our police structure where they have people in charge of every police sector. And so if they wanted to kill somebody in a police sector, they called the guy in that police sector and said, go out and kill somebody. And so the guy would just stand out outside his home, watch the patrol car go that way, walk out a couple of blocks on the other side, kill the person they wanted to kill, get back to his home. The patrol car didn't have enough time to come back and catch him. And that's what is happening right now, also still. <clears throat> what are we doing to change that? We now have 800 patrol cars in the city with the 5,000 additional police officers from the federal government. Because when the Army came in, the Army didn't have patrol cars. The Army has big trucks. So they, they didn't help us with patrol cars. The federal police has patrol cars. So now we have about 900 patrol cars, uh, a little under 900 patrol cars in the city patrolling every sector. We have about 120 sectors. So, so you can see the amount of patrol power we have there. Plus, we have intelligence operations. About 100 police, federal police officers are working intelligence. So uh, that is something that, that has changed uh, dramatically. It, it changed initially, but then when we, when we did patrol, it, you know, the patrol only goes so far. And, uh, and, and with the Army, that's all we could do. There, 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 there wasn't, the, the Army could not become a police department because the, uh, the officers are not police. Mayor Reyes Feliz, again, I want to thank you for uh, coming here and giving us this opportunity to ask you questions. I've been uh, visiting Juarez for the past seven years. Uh, doing research and journalistic work and, and so it's very useful to have to get to meet you have this conversation and I realize you probably have the toughest job in the country of Mexico right now and, and I don't think any of us would want to be in your shoes. Um, I want to ask you first on this point of, of cleaning up and rebuilding the police department which has been your signature initiative as mayor. Um, you got rid of 700 agents and you built up the force, you hired uh, 1,500 new agents or so. And you administered polygraph exams and some other sorts of uh, psychological exams to determine whether the agents coming in are clean. Beyond getting rid of corrupted police forces, what did you learn about the culture of corruption, the structure that permits it to flourish in the police forces, what happened to those 700 agents who left? Do you know what they're doing now? And how do you ensure that beyond your administration, these new agents 
that you've invested in, that you know came in clean, that you provided military training for, what prevents them from undergoing the same process um, because of the structure and the culture of corruption in the police force? How do you keep the police force clean? I think all of Mexico wants to know this because it's a problem nation. Yeah, th I think that's a main point. Uh, uh, oh, actually, we recruited 2,200. Uh, the last year, oh, it was 1,400. But the year before, when we did the firing, we recruited uh, close to 800. Uh, so now, four out of five police officers in Juarez have been recruited and trained within the last two years. We, we were talking in lunch before coming in, and, and they said, what's the main problem other than violence? And, and it's necessarily corruption, the main problem that we have in the country. And not just in what is that's a that's a tremendous problem that we face in our country, and uh, the corruption in the police department wasn't didn't take place overnight. It took about 15 years to corrupt the police department. Uh, police department when we took over was so corrupt. The head of the police department who I fired first thing I came in contact with the police department, which was 12 o'clock at night the first day I, I became mayor. He was stopped going into the United States with a ton of marijuana two months later. That's the size of the corruption that the police department had. If this is the operational chief of the police department. And uh, but I, I think one of the factors that promoted corruption was that for 15 years there was only one group of criminals working in Juarez. The Juarez cartel was the, the only cartel in Juarez. Uh, and all they had to do with the police department was say, you know, look that way. And you get some money. And the police officer basically didn't have to do anything. So it was easy to corrupt. Now, I think over 70 police officers have been killed. A good size portion of those were killed by one side of the other or the other because they were working for the other side. So now receiving corruption has become a higher stakes. Uh, proposition, and I, and I think that in itself will uh, create a barrier towards corruption. But in any case, we need to continue to do our confidence exams. I just fired 21 police officers two weeks ago, four weeks ago. The uh, day after I fired those police officers, head of an animal was left in a part of the city with a sign that said, you may or have 15 days to live. Uh, it is very painful for the criminal organizations to have those police officers, they have corrupted fire. But it's very important for us to do it. And the next government, I'm leaving office in six months. There are selections in three months. Whoever wins has to continue that work. It is tremendously risky. Uh, the uh, when we did the cleanup. I had an administrative assistant at the police department, 42-year-old woman with a couple of kids. She was murdered because she was the one sending the officers to the confidence exams. When we were about to fire the police officers who failed the confidence exams, you could hear in the police radio threats against the mayor and the chief of police. At the end of the day,
five <coughs> attorneys who headed the legal department for the police department who had to do the firing quit, one after the other after receiving threats. We had to bring in a law firm from Mexico City, an unnamed law firm from Mexico City. Bring him in at night, give him the list. Nobody in the government saw the list. The next day, 6 o'clock in the morning, these attorneys started firing people, giving them their severance pay. Then the Army had to take him to the airport so they could go to Mexico City and disappear. 50 city officers have been killed in this whole process, including the chief of police who did the cleanup. A retired captain from the Army, his name was Sacramento Perez. He was killed after the cleanup. It's extremely difficult. It's not easy. It's decisions that put in risk not only the mayor, because the mayor has protection. It puts in risk the staff that has to do the cleanup. And that's what makes it extremely difficult. I've had three of my staff, three friends of mine killed in this process. One of them I met in my office, big guy, former head of the uh, uh, police, I saw him in my office and he had this level five vest. And, and he was inside the city mayor's office. And I could see his eyes and I could see he was scared. It is difficult, but you have to do it. We have to do it. Juarez cannot allow the police to become corrupt again. It's cost too many lives. If we don't continue to do that work, then later on, it's gonna be twice as tough. More people will die. And, and that is uh, what we need to continue to do, is just to make sure, and, and it's, it's not gonna be a decision of the outgoing mayor. Outgoing mayor ends his job October 8th, 9th. It's going to be a decision of the population. The population will have to make it an issue that the cleanup of the police department will become standard in the city and will continue uh, beyond the following administrations. And my second question is return to, returning to one of John's points that I think deserves expanding on, and that's the subject of the military and uh, the claims of uh, human rights and constitutional violations. Uh, I went to Juarez in January of last year after, at the close of 2008, after the city saw the murder rate uh, increase by uh, five times. To try to figure out what were some of the factors at play in the city, and realized after a number of conversations throughout the year, that in fact one of the central problems from from what I perceived from the people I spoke with, was in fact the uh, continued violations of the army. There were claims of the army going to the poor neighborhoods in the city, um, knocking down people's doors, taking young men by force, and uh, disappearing them for days, torturing them, uh, just to ask who sells drugs on their street. And then many of them were charged. Um, with weapons possession and drug possession and are sitting in prison. Others never reappeared. Others appeared uh, dead. Their bodies were found. And at first I thought maybe it was a case of a few soldiers who were acting on their own, but it was interesting to me that everyone seemed to know this was going on. Uh, people wouldn't give me their names necessarily for publication, but the staff at the prison told me that the individuals who were being brought in by the army were severely beaten. The public defenders told me that the individuals they were representing were beaten and they showed me photos. People at the hospitals who attended these victims knew about it. The public ministry knew about it. So I wonder, uh, considering that the problem to me seemed more widespread and really systematic, that there was 
that this was part of the military strategy in order to collect intelligence. Um, we know that in Mexico right now, the military is the only institution that investigates itself. And uh, the rates um, of uh, convictions have not been very good, just to share a number released recently by the Army. Since December 2006, when Felipe Calderón took office, 3,430 citizen accusations against the Army have been filed. It's 3,400. Only six of those complaints have resulted in convictions. The Army has only found that 0.01% of the individuals um, signaled out in these accusations were criminally responsible. So my question is, if the city of Juarez is an equal partner in the Operación Conjunta Chihuahua in your public security strategy, have you considered or will you consider making a statement about the military's actions? I understand that you need them in the city. I understand that the federal police is now taking a larger role, but it seems like a crucial problem to me that the problem of the use of force in Juarez and of violence was responded to with violence that the problem of illegality in Juarez was responded to with illegality on the part of the army. Can you make a statement about that? I think that's a, a very important issue that, that needs to be addressed. When I met with the Secretary of Defense of Mexico, he, and when we were talking about how the operation with the army would take place in Juarez. He told me bluntly and clearly, I'm sending in the army, I don't want any abuses. I know sometimes they take place. I want to make sure that we don't have that. So he asked me to open an office to do the follow-up on any abuses. I named Javier Gonzalez Mokin. He was the dean of the law school when I went to law school. He's a very respected attorney in Juarez. I named him to head the Office of Complaints Against the Army. We received about 900 complaints, a little over 900. Those complaints I review often. And in reviewing those complaints, it, it is something is very clear. About half have to do with the federal police, about half have to do with the army. But it's very clear that those complaints do not come about army officers and patrol cars. We have Initially, 2,400 Army officers in patrol cars with the police department. Now, until last week, we had 1,200 Army officers in patrol cars. And the population tells me the guys in the patrol cars are nice. They, they are not abusive. Uh, they, they, we don't have any complaints against them. The complaints come for the Army that's doing work against organized crime. And I've seen the complaints. They come mainly from parents of people arrested. And they say that when they were arrested, they were abusive. abusive. The army was abused. Guy was arrested three weeks ago. His nickname is Arnold. He was arrested mainly because he killed five people, two of them army officers from the United States. Those guys were killed in a strip club called, called Amadeus. The evidence the Mexican government has against Arnold is clear evidence. There's a video of him going to where the five people killed were. He says hi to all five of them. 
including the two Army officers from the United States, goes out, comes back with a gun, kills all five. Five other people that were there stood up and left with him. Those five people were arrested. Thanks to the action of a police officer that went in and got the video. The video had been erased, but he got it. The police officer was later killed. Arnold was detained. There's clear evidence. You can see his face, clear as day. There's no need to uh, torture somebody where you have clear evidence like that. Uh, he was put in jail, and there's a complaint from his family saying that the Army was abusive in uh, detaining this guy. <coughs> These are hardcore criminals. They kill for a living. That's what they do. This, the actions of these guys, you know, you cannot come in and say, hey, listen, I have an arrest warrant for you. Uh, please come follow me. And, uh, and those are the complaints. Are there abuses? I don't know. The city does not investigate that. The city is not an investigating agency. Do I think there are abuses? I don't think that you can uh, go ahead and act against criminals pardon criminals like this uh, politely. Uh, is the presence of the army committing abuses against the population? No. Uh, the, the fact that we don't have any complaints against those in the patrol cars uh, clearly shows us that where the complaints come from have to do with uh, the detentions and related to organized crime. And, and that's uh, something that, although the president of Mexico said, we need to investigate, we need to make sure that there's no abusives there, uh, I don't think you can handle them very politely. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If you'd like to stay at the podium, uh, this is me now. Uh, reach the, the final portion of our program in which we'd like to continue the dialogue with questions from all of you. Uh, again, please uh, be uh, brief and to the point following the pattern that was established with the panelists. And I'd like to, to go uh, one by one if possible in order to maintain this, the spirit of this, of this dialogue. Uh, Could you please state your name and affiliation when you ask? Fine. Buenas tardes, me llamo Héctor Domínguez, encantada, profesor que me ha been a researcher, working on Juárez for about more than 10 years, on Barney's culture, in Juárez, for me to have culture, it's something that is very organized, very systematized, and I understand you, it's so deep. Uh, unfortunately, I find two versions about the military uh, uh, be behavior in Juarez. One, the official one, what you already said, and the other one, what the people in Juarez said. I have hundreds and hundreds of interviews with people in Juarez that are not, uh, don't agree with what, what you just said. But is, this is not the point I'm, I'm going to talk about now. Uh, the landscape of Juarez. I want to take this uh, uh, In the last months, I, I, I travel to Juarez almost every two months. In the last month, I have noticed that this downtown area of uh, Mariscal Street, uh, even uh, the Juarez Street, the mother, is just demolished. When we talk about war in Juarez, this is a, the main image I can present. This is a war fear. This is just demolished. It disappeared. And let me tell you, this is the area that attracted most of the visitors to Juarez. So it, 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 it seems like the all touristic resource is just spent. It's just erased. 
forest landscape. Another aspect of forest landscape I want to point to, and I would like to hear where to comment about this, is that there is a concentration camp in forest. I'm talking about La Colonia uh, Poleo Alto, where there are illegal uh, uh, paramilitary obstructing the free circulation of people, uh, there, there, there are burnt uh, uh, houses, etc. And, uh, and that was uh, paid by one of the uh, most prominent families in Ciudad Juárez de Zaragoza. What is your view about these two uh, aspects of the uh, uh, urban landscape in Juárez? Oh, I think uh, one in downtown Juárez is uh, we have a very uh, a street that, was, that is very important for Juarez. I, I grew up there. I uh, went dancing there when I was in, a, in college, and I love Juarez Avenue. Juarez Avenue is uh, right across the border, and it's a city where about 40,000 college students go to, uh, used to, <laughs> used to go to, uh, some, some high school students. Uh, a legal drinking age in what is is 18. So we have UT El Paso with 20,000 students. We have uh, UT, uh, UNM Las Cruces uh, with, uh, about, I think, 22,000 students. And everybody who's over 18 but not in college, and they used to go there. They, they, it, was, it was where you would go to drink. Two things happened. One, the US government said, everybody who goes into Mexico and walks back into, Me into the US can no longer do it with a regular ID and just say, I'm a US citizen. Now you need to have a passport. It's called the uh, North American Travel Initiative. Uh, and it took place into, into effect February 2008. Second thing that happened was the violence, of course. And so students stopped going. It just, uh, there's nobody else there. Uh, mm -hmm. People from Juarez no longer went there. So uh, unfortunately, that area is, is not no longer economically active. The area behind it, is the area where prostitution would take place in what is a street called Mariscal, and it is well known for prostitution. Uh, we decided, state government and city government decided to close down that area. We started purchasing the uh, buildings. We've already purchased about 120 buildings. There's about 160 buildings, and we have demolished all the buildings. Uh, we're, we haven't been able to buy all of the buildings that we set out to, to buy. It's been a difficult negotiation with the owners. Uh, but we're getting ready to do a big plaza in that place. Uh, one, if you go recently, and, and I hope you, you can go and, and visit, uh, the gymnasium, we have a, a, a very nice sized gymnasium there, uh, Ignacio Neri Santos, uh, which used to be for those that like wrestling, uh, Bori Guerrero, the father of uh, famous U.S. wrestler, Guerrero, I don't know his name, but he passed away a few years ago. But uh, he, he used to do wrestling there, and then it was full all the time. But but you couldn't do it now because there's no parking, there's no uh, no way to do it. Now we're building parking lots and we're building uh, a nice arena and. Uh, when we celebrate a 200 anniversary in, uh, in September 16th, uh, the bicentennial, Mexico's bicentennial, we're going to have a big party there, and uh, hopefully some of you can get a passport <laughs> and, and go and have a drink legally in, uh, in Juarez. But that, that's what's going on uh, here. And it's not a war zone. It, it's, uh, it's planned development of, uh, of the downtown. Uh, 
on the other hand, uh, Lomas de Poleo, it's a, it's a complex litigation. About 60 families took over uh, a piece of land. Uh, there's litigation there about of the 60, 60 families, about 48 families have moved to another place. Uh, they, they've come to agreements with the owners of the land. They moved them to another place. 12 families remain in that place. They're, they are litigating tremendously between them. Uh, the, uh, they, so the litigation is over, let's say, 12 acres, uh, 1,000 acres. And uh, the owners of the remaining 900 uh, and 88 acres decided to close down the area so that nobody else would come in and take over the, the property. It's uh, it, it's something that it didn't happen when I was uh, when I was mayor. It happened before. Uh, we as a city can only maintain the status quo. Uh, we need. Uh, judicial decision to solve that issue and, and hopefully it'll be solved pretty soon so that uh, that, that issue can be resolved. Uh, hi Mayor, thanks for coming. I'm Elizabeth Elbosky from the Texas Observer Magazine. And I wanted to know what your definition of success is in WISE and whether you can really ever obtain success in Juarez or in, in Mexico with the cartel of violence without a major change in U.S. drug policy? I'm sure you've been asked this question. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's the main issue. Uh, it's, we have, uh, since President Calderon took office, when he took office, 90% of cocaine consumed in the United States came from Mexico, 90%. Now it's down to 60%. Is that success? I think so. Uh, has cocaine stopped flowing into the US? No way, it, it, it's just going through someplace else. That's the problem right there. That's the problem. And, and the root of the problem, the American using drugs and America does not want to stop that. Yeah, I, I think when you have, and, and, and I've had the chance to to be in the negotiations at the, with the Secretary of State in, in Washington when negotiations were made between the Mexican government and the U.S. government, and uh, I don't know, and, and I'm not in a position to say whether legalization of drugs is good or bad. I don't know. That's for policymakers to, to make that decision, congressmen. So, but we need to have a consistent policy between Mexico and the U.S. When we were making burial plans for Sacramento Perez, I learned that Michael Phelps was not to be charged with drug use. And for Mexican government officials who have people losing their lives in the fight to stop the flow of drugs into the United States, it is very painful to have the dead on our side. And once the drugs come into the United States, nothing's done. I can't believe that if you throw a piece of paper in California out of the window in the freeway, you get an $800 fine. If you're caught with marijuana, you get a $50 fine. It's inconsistent policies. And having inconsistent policies makes this a tremendous problem. If Mexico is to be forced to have a policy of fighting the flow of drugs into the United States. The U.S. should have a policy of opposing the use of drugs. If the U.S. policy is lenient on the use of drugs, then the policy on other countries should be lenient on 
on the flow of drugs into the United States. Because when you ask about the definition of success, I think for Mexico, the definition of success, unfortunately, it is to have the drugs go someplace else, through someplace else. That's our definition of success. We're not stopping the flow of drugs. We just don't want them going to our backyard. And uh, that's not a good definition of success to have. But it's the only definition of success we can have as long as the U.S. is the biggest consumer of drugs in the world. Um, my name is Prieta Falcón. I'm a third year marketing student here at UT. And I, I was wondering if you could elaborate more on the femicide that's going on in Juarez, especially since you said that Juarez isn't the most particular place where, or the most favorable place for drug trade. That might open it up to other legal activity involving sex trafficking. So where is you know the battle against femicide in Juarez right now, and what do you do to combat it? Well, I think that's uh, that's another of the very painful issues for for Juarez. Uh, and, and just to put it in a nutshell, it, it's a I think we need to talk more about that than, than what we talked about to fully understand it, but. Uh, in the late 90s, killing of women began. In Juarez, it were serial sex-related killings of women. Mexican government, the governor said, geez, what can you expect? Look at how she was dressed. That was the policy. Mexican government didn't investigate. They didn't investigate. And uh, things were so bad that when that government left office, they burned all the evidence of the women that were killed. All the clothes that were found, all the evidence that was collected was taken and burned. We could now do a uh, DNA, DNA tests and, and other things, but there's nothing to do the test on because it's gone. Next government said, oh, no, we can't do that. We need to have a good department working. They created a good department. Not much funding came to it. Uh, I was an attorney. There was a change in the department. And, and I wasn't in the government. I, th this is my first elected position as, uh, as anything. Uh, I talked to the assistant DA in charge of Juarez. New person was named. I didn't know. I hadn't seen them. And I told them. Is she any good? Assistant DA, this is the second top position, super jugador. Assistant Attorney General, I should say. Assistant Attorney General tells me, I don't know if she's any good, but she has the most beautiful legs. And that was the end. That was the end. Six years ago, when the new governor came in, he created a whole department, a whole department taking care of the killings of women. He brought in a group of Argentinian specialists, forensic specialists, to start looking at all the evidence we had, that evidence that hadn't been burned. They found bags full of bones. That, you know, they said, this is, Buddy one, yeah, actually, you know, it had a bone from Buddy seven, and it was just, they started working and trying to find out how to stop this. Uh, they, they put some people in jail. They did. The best thing that I can say is that 
recent crimes that have happened against women have been solved. The crime I told you about, Aidis Estrella, the little eight-year-old kid, girl that was killed by uh, this sex offender that was supported in Juarez. It was solved when her body was found in a barrel full of uh, cement. And they found tracks, and the tracks were investigated. They found what type of car they belonged to. They went to the neighborhood. They saw a burrito car. They investigated, and the guy in the burrito car was the criminal deported from the US, the guy who actually did it. They found forensic evidence to, to solve this. So uh, we had a problem. It, it's a very painful uh, time for what is. It's a time when the government didn't do what it was supposed to do. Uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights just found against the Chihuahua government and obligated to do many things. Among them, pay $250,000 to each of the mothers of the victims, uh, plus change a lot of things in its system so that this thing never happens again. And, uh, and we have a very large department now specifically designed to fight that. And, and, and I hope nothing like that uh, ever happens again. Yes, you have, you have, we're going to just have a few more questions, so there's a few more brief questions. Thank you for recognizing me. Uh, my name is Sara Valdez, Juareña, con mucho orgullo. Um, and I'm going to ask a question in English for um, the fellow panel to understand me better, and then a brief commentary in Spanish, if it's okay with you. That's fine. Um, first, I'm going to ask that um, you be very honest and brief when it comes to this answer. Um, it's very easy to assume that as mayor of Ciudad Juarez, you have the best intentions and the best hopes for the city. However, I want to ask, how do you feel as a politician and as a citizen of a fallen and violent state, being able and being aware of your inability to solve for the problems of Ciudad Juarez? And as a brief comment that follows, um, hace poco nos enteramos que su familia y usted mismo ha sido amenazado de muerte. Pero no se preocupe porque quiero que usted sea tranquilo, quiero que usted sea paciente porque la violencia en Juárez no discrimina, la violencia en Juárez es solidaria y su familia no es la primera ni la última en ser amenazada. citizens of security. That's what governments were created for. Uh, the problem in Juarez is very large. And the security of the citizens of Juarez is not there, not what we want. That's a fact. Is it a fallen state? Is it something that an inexistent government, an inefficient government? <coughs> if you go to the root of the problem, we're not providing security to our citizens. That's what we have to do. Can we provide security to our citizens? as fast as our citizens want it? No. Will we? Yes. There's a road, and the road is clear. It's not something that you, know, you have to find a way to do it. No, it's clear. You need a police department. You need an efficient police department. You need a police department that you can trust. You need a police department that will act. And the road to creating a police department like that is not something that you have 
invent out of nothing. It's unfortunate that you can't do it the next day. But you can do it. And I think uh, the, the feeling uh, that all of us have, and, and all of us have it, of course, those of us who have the responsibility uh, have more of it, is that it hasn't come soon enough. And many in the population feel that. But I have lived through it for two and a half years now. And I can tell you with all certainty that things are very different today. The problems have not been solved, and, and I make it very clear. But the structure that we have to solve the problem is extremely difficult extremely different than it was two and a half years ago. And having done that, we are now in a position to go ahead and start solving the problem. It's, uh, it's not a long road. It has been very important for us that the road included an economic crisis beyond any economic crisis that Juarez had ever seen. Uh, there's a very important researcher. Her name is Clara Cusima. I think uh, Professor Dominguez uh, may know her. She's one of the most respected uh, professors in Mexico that studies what is. And, and she did the definite book on the problems in what is because the problems, social problems I talked about are very different than any other city. And last time I saw her, she said, I have never seen hunger in Juarez. And, and seeing hunger and having this security problem makes matters so much more difficult to solve. Hopefully, the US will get back in track uh, economically, and that will help us. And, and we hired about 25,000 people uh, since the start of the year, so uh, we are getting back economically into track. Uh, but the road uh, has to be walked. It, it's, uh, uh, the president of Mexico said, fighting this war is gonna cost lives, and none of us, none of us would want that to happen. But unfortunately, 20 years of corruption has led to the amount, to the Mexican cartels being the biggest cartels in the world. They're, they're bigger than the Colombian cartels who they initially started getting drugs from. And now we need to solve that and, and it's going to be a very hard issue to solve. So you just have room, uh, time for one final question and you've been very patient back there. And, and that will be, I'm sorry to all those wanted to speak, but uh, we're going to have to close up this question. Um, my name is Aldo Sanchez, and I'm also a fellow Juarez. For all those say we're very serious. And my question is, today, earlier today, I was reading the newspaper of the Adio de Juarez, and I read that the United States Congress had made a, we were talking about having the Pentagon involved with the situation in Juarez. And then I also read that the counterpart, the Congress in Chihuahua and the Congress in Mexico have all denied this, uh, stating the sovereignty of a country and all this. Um, I want to know what your opinion on this is. I know Colombia, when they had a, what was the name, Escobar, did get help from the Delta Forces here in the United States, and it helped them. I mean, they got Escobar killed and obviously brought the crime down. So I want to know like, what, what your honest opinion is on uh, US involvement. I know the sovereignty, I'm not saying like cool, army invasion or anything, but at least having CIA or FBI agents, which I know worked when the two council mem uh, members of the United States were killing by this not too long ago. So I'd like, like to know. Yeah, I, I think uh, it, it definitely, definitely this, the solution to this problem 
It's a joint solution. This is, I think, a big part of the problem is that during eight years of the Bush administration, the view in Washington was, wow, there's a problem in Mexico. Let's build a big wall between the two countries so that that problem doesn't cross into the United States. Uh, I, I was mayor for uh, a little over a year of the Bush administration, and I didn't get a single door open to talk about the issues in Juarez. None. They didn't want to even think about Mexico. Uh, the Obama administration came in, and, and, I, and I think President Bush told President Obama, the, the three points you have to take care of is Mexico, Afghanistan, and uh, uh, Iraq. But the policy has changed, and uh, the, the doors are open. And, and I can tell you, when I started speaking, Arnold Schwarzenegger said, we have a tremendous fiscal problem in California, and we have 20,000 Mexicans in jail, illegal aliens in jail. They cost us, I think they cost like $4 million a day. We're going to take them out of jail, have them deported into Mexico. He has a right to do that. He is, uh, they're Mexican citizens. They can deport them, yes. But I said, hey, you know, deport them. I, I don't care. Not true bodies. <laughs> and, uh, and, then to, and then we began to review the deportations. And then we began to find out how the deportations have to do with the problem. And so I was able to speak with Janet Napolitano about it. I was able to speak to Alan Burson, who was then the, the border czar is now the head of Customs and Border Protection. I was able to speak with the head of the Border Patrol about it, national head of the Border Patrol. I was able to speak with the drug czar about it. And they listen. Starting March 1st, it is the policy of the United States not to deport criminals through whites. We were getting 300 to 500 people deported per day through Juarez. Since they stopped deporting criminals through Juarez, we're getting five to 60 persons deported through Juarez. 90% of those deported were criminals. Some had light crimes, like falsification of social security, which has a lot to do with being an illegal alien. But a lot of them criminals. And so that issue is going to have an effect in what is five, ten years from now. But there are so many other issues that we need to face. There are so many other issues that need to be dealt with jointly. And, uh, and the United States helped Colombia. They, they sent in uh, billions of dollars to Colombia to, to to help them control their problem. They did. And, and I think our problem comes from $35 billion worth of consumption of drugs in the United States. You know, sending $400 million to Mexico to try and stop that is not enough. The US Congress has to get involved. And then it doesn't mean that they're going to send the army into Mexico and then create bases in Mexico. No. It, it means that they can work jointly with, uh, with the Mexican government. And, and I can tell you, I trust President Calderon. I know President Calderon is doing a great job. I, I know he's, it's a difficult job. And many Mexicans are very upset at him that, that, that this is being done, that this is being costing so many lives. But sovereignty should be a, an issue in stopping <laughs> us from working jointly with uh, with the U.S. The, the U.S. has the technology, the expertise, the police department. They, they, they're the most advanced police department in the world. And, uh, and those advancements in, in policing uh, 
uh, are what we need. We, we, we're definitely not 10% as advanced as the U.S., so uh, we, need, we need to help, and then we should.